Um, my name is um, Katie Lee Bunting, and uh, we'll each introduce ourselves um, when we do our land acknowledgements. Um, but welcome to Can I Submit That? Using Student Assessment to Challenge Power Structures in Our Learning Environments as part of the CTLT Spring Institute. And we're really grateful for you all being here. We were chatting before folks came in at saying how <clears throat> many of us are pretty tired at this point in the year and uh, we register for things and then it comes time to participate and then feel a bit maxed out. <laughs> so thanks for showing up, we appreciate it. So um, I identify as a abled um, cis white woman who is of settler ancestry. My ancestors are from mostly from Ireland, but also from France. Um, and so in naming that, I acknowledge that my ancestors came here uninvited and were part of the colonial project that Canada, Canada is founded on. Um, so I am joining from what is now known colonially as Burnaby Heights. And um, in naming this land, I want to um, give uh, gratitude and honor uh, the um, nations of the tsleil uh, Squamish, Salo, and Musqueam. Um, First Nations on whose land I now live on and who have uh, cared for and been in relationship with these lands for thousands and thousands of years, much longer than the couple generations that my family has been here. Um, and I'm with the Department of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy. I'm an assistant professor of teaching there. And I'll pass it over to Judy. Hi, um, my name is Judy Chan. I am a education consultant with the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology. I'm also a sessional lecturer with the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. Um, I would like to echo Katie that I am myself a first generation settler here on this land. Um, the the shared the, the shared space between the Miscreams, Coast Salish, and the Slewatup um nations and also known as um, South Vancouver. I'm currently reading this book here, um, really talking about our responsibility to protect the land. And so a very good book. We can talk about that at a different session. Um, but so I would really continue to think about how I can protect the land because according to the book, when we protect our land, the land will protect us. I'm going to pass on to our student presenters. Lisa, you're on top, right next to me. So maybe Lisa first. Perfect, thank you, Judy. So hello, my name is Lisa Pertsev and I'm one of, uh, I was in Katie's class uh, last semester. I'm a, I'm a student of the Masters of Occupational Therapy program at UBC. Uh, and I am currently zooming in from Coquitlam, which is the traditional unceded and ancestral lands of the Coquitlam First Nation peoples. I will pass it on to Nicole because she's right underneath me. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Banting. I'm very excited to be here today. I'm also a first year Masters of Occupational Therapy student at UBC and I'm joining from what is colonially known as Victoria. Um, and I'm very grateful and respectfully acknowledged that I'm on the traditional territories of the Songhees, Esquimalt and Mazanic peoples on whose historical relationships with the land continue today. And I'll pass it off to Parmeet. Hello, my name is Parm and uh, I'm a student occupational therapist here as well. I took a class as well with Katie Bunting and um, I'm sitting here uh, at the city of Surrey and I acknowledge that the land that we're gathering on today or that I'm on today is a treaty territory of the Tawasan First Nations and the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Kwantlen, Katsi and Semiamo First Nations. Thank you. All right, thanks. And we invite folks to share what Indigenous land you're joining from and share your land acknowledgement in the chat box if you'd like. Okay, so for the sake of time, um, we'll share our stories of how we got here rather briefly. Um, but I sort of had a um, an awakening moment, um, the end of the winter term before actually the pandemic started. So if we can remember that far back in, I think that was 2019. Um, and I, I had uh, taken over a course and um, it had always, it, since I'd been participating in it, had sort of these large um, summative tests at the end that were short answer in person written out. And I was sitting there um, invigilating and saw these students come into the room that, you know, I really cared about these students. and had tried to be intentional in my teaching, you know, through the course of, of being mindful of their well-being and 
trading relationship. And I see these folks I care about coming in and, you know, eyes red rimmed, looking so stressed out. And all I could think of with, you know, and being mindful that I don't have t- total control over their lives or I'm not the only influence, but just thinking that, you know, my decision to have this summative test as the only choice here um, was harming a lot of these students. And, you know, that was a real um, moment for me to want to do things differently. I don't know if other um, folks, Judy, Lisa, Parmer, Nicole, want to share anything? I can go ahead. I guess just for me, um, my background is in kinesiology at UBC, and I've always been interested in occupational therapy. So I had an opportunity to apply and get into the UBC occupational therapy program. So uh, that's where I crossed paths with um, Katie and the other professors that we're working with. And uh, we're actually right now on placement and able to be here today. So that's kind of a little bit about my journey. So similar to PARM, um, I also have a bachelor's in kinesiology from UBC, uh, and then I applied to the master's of occupational therapy program, which I love so far, and that's how I met Katie, um, and that's how I ended up here. And as PARM said, we are currently on placement, on our second placement, which is very exciting, but um, we are super excited to be here. Yeah, I was very excited for the opportunity and the invitation from Katie to participate in this presentation. Um, Coming to the Masters of Occupational Therapy program, just the way that we were evaluated was so different from how I was evaluated in my undergrad. And so I just wanted to share kind of a student perspective on how that's been for me so far. And I'm actually one of the few students who chose to do the summative test. And I kind of wanted to share my thought process around that and maybe provide a different perspective as well. Hi. Well, Katie, your questions here just took me all the way back to my undergraduate years. That's many years ago. And I just I was one of those students who didn't pay attention to the learning objective, but I will madly note down every single due day of all the quizzes, assignments and final exam. And I study according to to the exam, um, according to how I would be evaluated and and that wasn't very useful. That was very stressful. So when, when Katie, you asked me to join you in this journey, um, can I submit that? I'm like, yes, let's, let's talk about what we can do as instructor um, and try to release some of the stress associated with, with assessment. Thank you, Katie. Great, thanks. Yeah, so that leads us well into our learning objectives. So overall, we're looking at, you know, how, how can we support student well-being and really enrich learning experiences through how we design assessments and address power dynamics. So I'm going to pass it over to Lisa to share with you our learning objectives. Yeah, so uh, by the end of this workshop, we will be able to, number one, identify how traditional methods of student assessment can reinforce oppressive power structures in higher education. Number two, critically appraise your own methods of student assessment. And number three, apply an anti-oppressive and relational lens to begin to design more more just and equitable methods of student assessment. So then our agenda will closely follow our learning objective. We will go over what is student assessment. We will ask you what is student assessment to you. Um, And Katie is going to introduce to us um, anti-oppression and relational teaching and how we can use critical appraisal and critical reflexivity to redesign our assessment strategies. We will then have some time to put these three together um, in a mix of different type of activities, such as breakout rooms, um, to look at our student assessment, applying the two, the four concepts, or two or four concepts, and also applying these concepts into our own assessment strategies. And at the end, there will be time for us to share and wrap up. I would also like to know that um, these ideas about using, looking, having a critical lens to look at our assessment strategies. Katie and I, we are not the first people to to do this at UBC. Um, We've been inspired by a few people, such as Kenneth Rydell from the Food, Nutrition and Health Program, Um, Christine Donovio from Art History, Visual Arts and Theory. And also Carol Ann Cuneo, um, Cellular and Physiological Sciences. They've been using different form of assessment strategies that, that at least for me, I would like to call them. I would like to use what they're using in the classroom. And recently, in the, I would say in the last few months, 
Um, there's a lot of talk about ungrading. Um, there are like two sessions on ungrading at the Spring Institute. One of them will be at tomorrow morning. And so I would like to, you to, if we inspire you, so I, I would invite you to also join those sessions on ungrading. So we are going into, we, like I said, we're going to ask you, what is student assessment? And so what you can do is go into one of your windows or take out your phone and just go to menti.com and use this passcode 4203. Thank you, Katie, for putting it in the chat and 4963. Let us know what you think student assessment is. And this is an open-ended question you can submit multiple times. All right, so we'll hold these ideas of what student assessment is um, throughout so that to test understanding, evaluate learning, stressful, um, sort of a query of it, is it an evaluation of student learning, um, bringing in self-evaluation of those students and instructors, that it can be uninspiring, um, it can be quite contextually constrained, um, and often student assessment is required to gain marks for, um, for a course. Um, all right, so next we're going to ask you to share with us what student assessment is not. And again, at menti.com, enter the code 42034963, and that's posted in the chat box. So considerations here around whether or not student assessment actually measures student, student learning, um, questioning the objectivity of student assessment and evaluation and grading, naming that it's not a reflection of students' worth, which is um, messaging that students receive from the point that they enter school, <laughs> um, reflecting how much effort a student has actually put in. Yeah, and in, in the ungrading literature, there's a lot of critique around that of considering sort of the baseline knowledge that students come into courses with and whether you know through grading we're actually showing um an, a measurement of how much knowledge students just came in with versus how hard they worked in the course or how much knowledge they gained yeah an evaluation of whether somebody's smart or not and what does it mean to be smart and what sort of epistemologies are valued there yeah and a limiting of student choice and autonomy unimaginative uncreative yeah so that's maybe actually a good point to pause on here and, and go back into um, the rest of our presentation. So thanks for engaging um, with us in that. And so um, we're sort of operating on the assumption that folks who have come to this workshop have um, a pretty good understanding already of some of the pieces we're gonna talk to you about. So we'll move through this content um, at sort of a somewhat quick and pace. So as probably quite a few of you know, um, and this is something that, you know, I started learning more about again, when, as I mentioned, I had this moment of like, what the heck am I doing um, in how I assess student learning? Um, so this um, use of a hundred uh, percentage scale uh, emerged in the early 1900s um, with letter grades really coming in to being used um, in the 1940s when um, uh, K to 12 education became, became a requirement. Um, and this is um, the information rooted in the United States, but Canada sort of maps quite closely to what's happening in the States there um, education wise. Um, when I'm talking about student assessment, I'm just focusing on grading because really that is the dominant way that we assess students. Um, the idea was that with grading, um, it would ostensibly sort of facilitate a uniform, consistent way of evaluating students um, across institutions. And, we know folks have critiqued that, like an A in one institution, you know, uh, we compare it to an A in another institution without really considering contextual factors there. So there's sort of this false um, valuing uh, that somehow grading is an objective um, process. And the aims of grading assessment were to sort students into groups. So you all talked about that, like a ranking of, of students um, and this notion of identifying your smart, it, that it is a measure of your worth, you know, this is the best and the good and pretty good. And we have those qualifiers attached to letter grades. It was a way of communicating to students whether or not they had succeeded um, in the course. Um, and the idea that through assessment, we can motivate students to learn. And that's sort of what you talked about, Judy, of just writing down absolutely everything you needed to know. And I was that kind of student. I did well with traditional grading because um, I was very 
driven to prove my worth through, through getting good grades and, and motivated to do that. Um, so that's a very quick overall in terms of student assessment and grading and where it came from. So the question is, you know, can we do better? And I think, um, you know, all of us shared um, our interest in being here with the belief that we can do better. And um, through your um, comments on what student assessment is and what it is not, I think that's probably a shared understanding with the folks here. Um, so this is a quote um, from um, the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, um, Ferry. So this quote resonates in terms of why we need to do better with student um, traditional student assessment methods. So in this nutri nutritionist banking approach to education, um, even when offered under the guise of progressive education, has as its major goal the fattening of the student's brain, the deposits of the teacher's knowledge, and thus, under this pedagogical model, students absorb understandings not born of their own creative efforts as learners. So it's this critiquing of this banking system of, you know, as an educator, I'm the holder of knowledge. I know what students need to learn best. I can best evaluate that with the assessments that I design myself. Um, and the idea is that I'm just stuffing students' brains with knowledge. And through doing that, it can really uh, eliminates the opportunity for students to have agency in their learning and to make creative contributions and to really make deeper connections that matter in the world. So this is kind of the, um, that critical pedagogy um, assertions that anchored um, some of the changes that we've made and how we evaluate student learning. So we wanted to introduce you all. I, I do want to preface this by saying I, I don't view myself as having expertise in anti-oppressive teaching or even relational teaching. You know, I, I come to this as a learner and it's something that I have engaged in learning around over the last few years. Um, but it certainly aligns with sort of my personal values and, and my values as an educator and as an occupational therapist. So in anti-oppressive teaching, you know, we're really looking at centering the assertion in education that the roots of that problems face or that the challenges that students face aren't residing in isolation within that student as sort of personal failings of that student, but really looking critically at the larger systems that are at play and how those systems are in relation with each other to systematically oppress and marginalize um, students as a whole really in education and how this is compounded for students um, uh, through that intersectional um, lens so that students who experience marginalization elsewhere, this is compounded in educational settings. So an anti-oppressive paradigm really informs our thinking so that we can question and critique and interrogate these larger sort of hegemonies within education and systems of power that actively marginalize and oppress students. So it's this critical questioning of, you know, what systems are at play here and how do those systems um, privilege some students oppress others and overall oppress all students. Um, so really questioning at a systems level um, why things are happening and how they impact students um, as opposed to uh, viewing um, student challenges as personal feelings without a larger critique of the system and, and making educational choices from that place. The other approach to education, so in addition to anti-oppressive teaching that's connected to critical pedagogy, is um, relational teaching. Um, and this is actually something I came to through Isabeau Iqbal at the CTLT um, as she recommended a work by Harriet Schwartz. And so in relational teaching, it's really centering that educational learner relationship, student teacher relationship in pedagogy and making educational decisions rooted in relationship. And again, this connects to critical pedagogy because relationality in teaching is typically not something that occurs in, in um, educational settings. Typically in educational settings, traditionally it's power over, or the educator has power over the student um, and decisions are made from that power over place. So Schwartz describes this as a practice wherein connection and disconnection with students, power, identity, and emotion shape teaching and learning endeavors. And so in relational teaching, we're really looking at centering authenticity, trust, empathy, connection, and common humanity uh, in our learning environments and really intentionally centering those as educators in our decisions and how we, our pedagogical choices and choices around student assessment. And this creates learning spaces where students hopefully feel able to take risks in their learning and assessments and feel like they have choice and agency um, within these learning environments. 
And so, you know, why does anti-oppression relational teaching matter? Um, it creates space for diverse student perspectives and knowledge and wisdom, which enriches experiences of, of mattering in classroom spaces and enriches and deepens student learning experiences. Um, and, you know, we have, um, folks have been pushing for greater diversity in student bodies admitted to, you know, higher education institutions like UBC. Um, but if we're, if we're creating, if we're welcoming students with diverse lived experiences and students with diverse identities that have historically been marginalized from uh, places like UBC, and then we're not changing the way that we um, uh, educate in those spaces, then we are just continuing to oppress and marginalize. So through anti-oppression and relational teaching, we create spaces where students are celebrated for their lived experience, are acknowledged for the um, knowledge and diverse um, sort of knowings uh, that they bring to this space. And so this fosters collaborative educational spaces between educator and students. And it is through relationship that students are motivated to learn and engage in their learning, as opposed to through um, a striving toward getting a particular grade. And culturally and ideologically and socially relevant curricula, as I mentioned, are more effective in enabling academic uh, development across all students. Um, so it allows for um, uh, a learning environment that, that um, celebrates all that students can bring. The other piece that we wanted to bring in here are the tools of critical appraisal and critical reflexivity. So critical appraisal is really um, questioning, um, reflecting, thinking, contesting, and evaluation of assertions made and to appraise the broader contextual factors that have formed these assertions. So a critical appraisal of our educational systems is asking these broader questions of, um, you know, who benefits? You know, why are we doing this? Who designed these? Why did they design these? What ideologies are present? How do they impact students? Why? So it's a consistent questioning of these larger systems at play um, and these larger contextual factors. And then critically, a critical reflexivity is unpacking our own positionality as educators. You know, so for myself in the in learning environments, my critical reflexivity is constantly thinking about, you know, for myself as a cisgendered uh, white woman of settler background who's able, uh, who did well and succeeded in traditional educational settings, grew up uh, upper middle class. I am not a first gen student. How does my positionality affect how I come into these learning spaces? How does my positionality affect how I, um, the decisions I make as an educator. And so it's really finding strategies to question our own attitudes and thought processes, our values, our assumptions and prejudices, our habitual actions as educators um, to become more aware of, you know, how might we be limiting the processes and how can this critical reflexivity actually um, allow for more liberatory practices in education. And so our approach in redesigning these student assessments was to uh, bring uh, our approaches of our, these approaches of relational teaching, so centering relationship and, and humanity, an anti oppressive uh, approach, so interrogating and problematizing systems of oppression in higher education and how those show up in our learning environments, um, and then using a critical appraisal as a tool, so active questioning of contextual factors shaping student assessments, and then always being engaged in critical reflexivity. So that critical knowing of our own positionality and how that impacts our decisions in the classroom. So we know that we're moving through this at a rather quick pace. Um, I see that there's been some conversation in the chat box. Thanks for keeping up with it, Judy. Um, if folks are okay, we're gonna move on to sharing some examples, um, educator and student perspectives um, of, uh, um, uh, uh, our experience of, of enacting this in OSOT 511, which is a first year, first term course in the Masters of Occupational Therapy program that explores the sort of foundations of occupational therapy knowledge and conceptual models and practice process. So um, I'm going to introduce this. I feel like I've been talking a lot and then I will gladly pass this over to um, uh, Parm and Lisa and Nicole um, to share a bit about uh, their experience of engaging in this. So this is um, a change made in um, OSOT 511, which again is in the Masters of Occupational Therapy program. So students come into the program with an undergraduate degree and various life experience. Um, and it's a two year, a 24 month um, entry to practice master's program. 
So historically in this course, as I mentioned, there was a summative in-person open-ended uh, question um, exam that was usually three hours, students would have three hours to complete it. Um, so this year we offered the choice of a critical creative project um, or a summative test. And when um, Lisa and Parm share their experience with the critical creative project, I'll pass it over to them to explain what they did and what that looked like. Um, 43 out of 64 students chose the critical creative project. 21 students chose this summative test, which was moved online and made open book and also open over the course of, um, uh, I think two days, Nicole, you can remind me, um, where students could choose when they wanted to log in to uh, write the test. Um, across both evaluations, um, the average, which I know is a bit of a crude measurement, um, was 87%. So that was consistent across both just by chance. Um, so I'll pass it over to um, Parm and Lisa to share their experience, and I'll stop sharing my screen so that you can see their faces more. Um, I'll also be sharing some other examples in the chat box that we got consent from students to share with you. Um, and the critical creative projects um, uh, are what uh, Lisa and Parm chose, and then Nicole's going to share about her experience with the summit of test. Um, okay, for, for me, uh... The ability to be able to control like my own way of learning, um, it really allowed me to uh, have a better fit for my personal needs and allow me to demonstrate my learnings in a way that was for my strength. I think a key component in occupational therapy and healthcare is understanding how your patient or client is on that day. So if they're down or if they have something, we don't really do full assessments on that day. So for me, having the opportunity to choose which, which, which assessment works and for me, that was really helpful in, in the ability to showcase um, what my actual knowledge was rather than coming in on one day and writing a full exam and uh, being done with it. Um, so I think that was what was important and being able to actually get out the information from my head and think about it at, at throughout the course and demonstrate it in a non-traditional um, non way, which was really helpful for me. So. That's kind of what the approach I took with the way that I did it and developing the artifact. And I think Katie is going to be sharing um, our PDF and uh, that we we created. So Lisa and I were actually partners for this uh, particular assessment, which was which was great. Yeah, kind of adding on to what Parma is saying. Personally, uh, I've never been a, a student that that particularly tests well. Um, I was never really a fan of the traditional testing methods. Um, I avoided them as much as I could. Of course, I still had to do what I had to do, I had to work very hard to uh, do well on them. Um, and I still, I am where I am for that reason, but I was particularly never a fan of them, kind of, a, kind of hated them. <laughs> so I had my own to feeling towards that. And, you know, when Katie presented this option to us, I thought it was such a unique opportunity because it allowed us both of Parm and I to um, you know uh, determine the things that we are currently struggling with and almost problem solve together to kind of solve something that wasn't working for for us at the moment uh, we we got to work together solve solve those issues we were having and as a result we were also able to utilize our strengths and create something that we are proud of today um, and with this specific project we we still use it today even even throughout our placements even throughout practice and we refer to it often but i think having that opportunity to to showcase our strengths and uh, be able to um, show her that that we can showcase our understandings i think that that made all the difference for us and as future occupational therapists i think i think it's important to be able to have a choice in a, in in something and you know uh whether that be parm nicole or i we could be exposed to this, the similar situation but we may not have or choose the same assessment so i think that kind of translates here as well we we, we had the same assignment presented to us, but we didn't, we, we all didn't choose the same thing. So uh, I think that's really important here and it can definitely apply to our futures. Thanks for sharing Lisa and Parm. Uh, for myself, I did my undergrad in science and it was a lot of my exams were very traditional. It was very much multiple choice exams, um, memorizing all the facts. And then when I came into the masters of occupational therapy program and took Katie's course, I was very surprised and really appreciative of the fact that we did have a choice in the type of assessment that we'd have at the end of our course. So again, I was one of the few students who 
um, chose to do the summative exam. And that was basically based on um, receiving the rubric, the learning objectives, sample questions, um, as well as the instructions for the other option. And so for me, I really took the time to kind of reflect on both of the methods of assessment, reflect on what learning style applied best for me. And as someone who really likes to do to um, write out my answers and reflect, and am more so of a traditional learner in that sense, um, I, I really reflected on the fact that that traditional assessment was what fit best with my learning style. And I know that other students you know, they have different learning styles than myself, but I think at the end of the day, having that that informed choice and that that agency to kind of direct my own learning was very helpful for me. And that's kind of why I decided to go with the summative exam. All right, great, thanks everyone. So I will share um, our slides again, and Judy's going to walk us through um, an assignment that she, is going to um, critique from this sort of four-pronged approach for us. Um, I also wanted to share that in the chat box in case folks don't have it open, um, I shared other examples of student work um, for the Critical Creative Project. Um, and then I also shared the outline of the um, this option for the assignment. All right, Judy, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, for, Katie. Katie, as you were talking through the end oppressions and everything, um, it really made me think about my own practice again. So I am not really following my script much. I just really want to think about I, my course and think about the situation. I, um, when, when you talk about anti-oppression, we were talking and then there was a little side chat um, with Michelle. It's a little small chat with Michelle. Like the anti-oppression is about the system. And for my course, one of the biggest system is, is an introduction course, but we welcome a lot of students. We welcome students from all over campus. The way I say welcome is actually my own reframing of the framework. Students are required, some of the students are required to take my course. These are students in the food nutrition and health program in the Faculty of London's food system. But 90% of my students are actually coming from outside of the faculty. And they are taking the course for many different reasons. One of them is for my students who is from art, they are taking it because it's a required science course. It's a, it's, it will fulfill their science credit. So they walk into my classroom, they're scared. Many of my students, some of the, some of my students love science and they love history or anthropology, but they chose to be a major in art. But many of, of my students haven't had any science since grade 10. And this is the last course that they need to do. They've been postponing taking a science course. This is the last course they need to take to graduate. So they haven't had any science for seven, eight years, and they're scared. They walk into my classroom being very scared, not knowing what science means to them and how they can survive through the course. So I think that's one of the, the, the systematic pressure that some, the, some of my students has. Some of my students are also taking the course because it's also a other credit. So they're science students and they are supposed to take some course that is outside of science and outside of art. And therefore, this course in the Faculty of Land and Food System is sort of perfect as a good fit. So I do have students who are taking the course for very different reasons. Um, I also teach in the summer. So I also have students who is working full time, traveling around the world, practicing in there, um, in the teams and doing all sorts of things. So I'm really thinking about my students. So I just, we don't have a lot of time. So I, I really think about what, how I, what is affecting my own and tone when I teach who I am. I share with my student who I am, my own upbringing, my science education, how I spent eight years of my life looking at a protein, the chemical structure of a protein, and how that protein now affects the bigger role of food, food consumption. And, and then in my course, I also develop a, a 
not only that I share, I also want my students to share, to build that relationship with each other. Um, what, what they want to learn, why they're taking this course. And I also really want them to, to learn about who else is in the classroom. What are our common goals and some of our common challenge. So I build a lot of activities around that. So it will help us do the assessment later. And one of this assess that is more related to assessment is that I do not have real deadline in my course. I, I tell them that we all live in a system. As an instructor, it's my responsibility to submit the grade to the bigger system. And therefore, there's no real deadline. Please give me a few days to do all the grading and all the marking. So the real deadline, I do have suggested guidelines to guide um, deadlines for all my assignments. But I tell them that if you cannot submit your work, it's okay. And throughout the six week, my students get to understand that it, when Julie say it's okay to submit something late, she really meant it because they've tried, they've asked me, they repeatedly asked me many times, is that okay? And I said, yes. So, so I just want to focus on some of my, my practice in assessment. So Katie, I know we are running out of time, so I'll pass it back to you. That's okay. I think um, it would be nice, Judy, to um, go through just your the process that you took in terms of critiquing this one student assessment, sure. yes. and then we'll skip mine, and then we'll go into the breakout yes. room hours. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So very, very quick. Um, so we have a lot of questions here, and and um, maybe just go to the next slide, Katie, because I put in a little bit of my my response to that. So to okay. to save us some time. Yeah, and we'll have these questions oh. available to folks when you do your oh. own work too. Yes. So, like I said, where are we now? So my students have a. I'm um, just really going to focus on the end of the term research paper. Um, lots of students, we only have six weeks, so there's really very little time for us to build relationship, for me to build a relationship with the students and for the students in the team to work together because it's a team-based project too. And many of students are coming from outside of the faculty and therefore they really bring with them lots of different expertise that we don't have for each other, for each other. So, so celebrating that um, range of strength in my students. So looking at the next slide, so I, there's, these are some questions that we ask ourselves. So why do I do this assessment? Who decides, of course, I am the instructor, I decide the assessment. I give them some guidelines on what they should be doing for this end of the term project. Um, yes, of course, I think I think when I develop my assessment, it, it um, aligns with my learning outcome. Yes, of course, yes, that's my course, it's my learning outcome and my assessment aligns with it. Um, but what is really missing? For me, the end of term research paper is very science -y. Well, it's a science course. It's actually missing a little bit of life. It doesn't really align. It's like it's a course on food. And I feel that this, this is our relation with the food. Our everyday eating of the food is missing. We talk about science and the chemical structures and safety and microbiology, but it's missing that connections to our everyday life that is missing. So when I developed this research project and it's a team base, I forgot to put it here. Who who is going to be who who is going to be advantage? It will be the science students because I have a lot. A third of my students are actually coming from the faculty of science, and because it's a team project, I think in our traditional grading system, we often talk about, are you a leader? Are you leading the group? Are you sharing your ideas? We really flavor the outgoing students, the students who are really more willing to share, the, real, the students who is going to speak louder and faster and earlier. So I think there's something in my traditional grading that favor those students. Um, are the students really part of the assessment? Not really in the beginning, no, but I, I, I started to give them more control 
or power, I give them lots of control of what they are going to work on the paper and also the format. So again, I still need to give them some guidelines because I don't have that time to build a relationship. I don't have the time to, to share what, to give them the everything, all the options, because they would get really lost. I still feel that I need to give them some framework. These are some suggestions. This is what you can do, and you have the freedom to choose. Um, in the traditional assessment, I also don't, they don't have a lot of role in their education. So what I have done then is that based on the, the results of the term project, they actually um, contribute to my final exams. So there is a small part. I don't have the time to go into the next slide, but I would just say it here. There's a small part that they will suggest some exam questions for the final exam. And I will then ask students in the whole class to study those final exam questions. These are the final exam questions that comes from the project and the student design it and students need to study each other's questions. Um, it's not a lot. I don't want them to read the whole pro project. It's, it could be too much, but really focusing on some of the questions contributed by the students. Um, yes, the, the worth, the value is all measured by grade in the past, but in what I've done is I've also included a lot of process work. Submit your reflection, submit your learning goal, submit tell me how you're going to work in a team. And as long as they are doing the work, they are going to be rewarded by, by a good grade. I will recognize the contribution and trying by giving them a grade. So I, I'm, I try to take some of these, some of my power in this course, in this assignment and give it back to them and also find ways to reward them and recognize the strength. So I will stop here, Katie. I think the next slide has more. It's too much. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and we will um, be sharing our slides. We're sorry that we didn't send them out ahead of time. Um, so what we'd like is um, for you all to have uh, a chance and time to um, apply this approach. So we've sort of designed this in two steps, um, one for an opportunity for you to do some thinking around it, and then one for you to do some application of it. Um, so uh, we'd like to hand it over to you. Um, and again, thanks for your grace with us at moving through this in a fairly quick pace. <laughs> um, I, I will pause if anybody has any questions in regards to um, the approach that we've outlined. Um, if anything is not clear to folks, we will have time at the end for discussion and um, more questioning around our experiences. Okay, so um, I think in one of my broadcast messages, I said, you know, time is oppressive and it, it is, you know, and so um, again, you know, we appreciate how much we are asking of you all to pack into a relatively short period of time. Um, you know, really the aim, our aim was that you could begin to maybe have a bit of a framework to start thinking through redesigning of some assessments. So um, we have about 10 minutes left. We do have some um, takeaways that Lisa and Nicole and Parm will be sharing with you all. So we wanna make sure we have time for that. Um, so we have about four minutes for discussion. But if anybody wanted to share sort of maybe something interesting that came up in your breakout rooms, if you had any sort of aha moments or anything that's still sort of sticky that you're, you know, is you feel a bit stuck on. Um, Sunaina, I see your hands up. Oh, yeah, thank you. I, I think one ongoing challenge that was evident in our last breakout room is our our limit the limitations we face around class size and TA hours, because many of the creative teaching practices require that we have capacity to grade uh, more than we currently do. And I wonder if you have any suggestions as to how we might consider anti-oppressive teaching in classes of 200, where we might have 12 hours a week of TA support. Yeah, that was the discussion we were having as well. 
is the reality that we we are working in these higher ed systems that don't uh, center the student agency and that don't center relationship. They're really um, uh, rooted in capitalism, um, and so you know we have to work within those systems. Um, and you know we know that over the last thirty years, education has consistently been defunded. So um, there is a session on ungrading tomorrow um, that we would recommend you all go to. Is it tomorrow, Judy? Is yes, it tomorrow. Okay. And I guess the other, oh, sorry, but just one more thing really quickly. I don't teach in 200 student classroom spaces. Um, I teach, I will be teaching with 72 students. Um, but I would also say like viewing this on a spectrum so that it's not all or nothing. And like, you know, there are small ways to bring in, you know, relational anti-oppressive pieces into your teaching um, that can be done, that can be scaled up. A very small example, this is outside of student assessment, but we use, um, we have classroom playlists that students contribute to. And so we play music um, at the beginning of classes and at breaks, and these are playlists that students have contributed to. And the idea with that is that students in the learning environments can see themselves there, you know, they hear their own music and even that in and of itself sort of disrupts the typical sort of power structures in the classroom. Judy? I, I teach in, a, my course has about 100 students and so I earlier on I mentioned that in my term project I have a lot a lot of little process steps submit your reflections submit your your team contract submit your outline submit your plan and to me knowing where they are in the planning process and what they're thinking and how they agree or disagree to work together um and, and basically, as long as they submit something, I basically would just give them the full mark of that, that piece. So the marking becomes quite easy. It's not as laborious. And, and I also find myself enjoying those small grading. So I, I, I often tell my students, if the term paper is worth 20%, by, by going through the process, they already earn 12%. <laughs> So in a way, it's a, a grading practice. Um, it just takes some of the time pressure off. But when I do that, my because again, it's a six week course. We the time time we don't have the time, and I don't have the I don't have enough TAs. So um, so it's the guiding them through the process and why why that's important. You build relationship, you plan, you do some research, you write something up, and and then. Then, then you demonstrate the learning. Um, so that's my way of handling that, that time pressure. But I really want to give some space for Nicole, Lisa, and Pam to share. One of my key takeaways from having the option to do either the summative assignment or the uh, more creative type of assessment was just that every student learns differently. Like I know that I know myself best and I know how I learn best and how I learn best is through a more, maybe more traditional assessment versus how Lisa and Parm are. They, they really jump at the opportunity to do a more um, creative type of assessment. And I, I just really appreciate having the choice and the agency to direct my own learning. And as someone who is going into a healthcare profession, it's also help, a helpful role model for myself knowing that you know, I want to give my own clients um, the choice to kind of direct their own treatment as well. And so um, it was just a really great um, opportunity for me to reflect on that. And I just really appreciated having that choice in my learning. So having the opportunity to direct our own learning um, has allowed me to find solutions to concepts I was having trouble wrapping my head around. Um, I found that this experience overall like, helped me gain essential problem solving skills that I can apply to my future as an occupational therapist. And overall, having a choice in assessment uh, created a, a space and a safe space to showcase my confidence and competence as, as a student. And, you know, after talking to Judy and Katie throughout this planning process for this workshop, I did not realize that I was under the assumption that professors go through the university to, to set a curriculum for the course. But in fact, they, they have a choice in how they want things to look as well. And, you know, something that I'll, that I'll probably continue to wonder is, um, since since professors have a choice in their course curriculum and what they want and they, what they want in their assessments, I wonder what they want to see from their students. Do they want students to showcase, you know, their strengths and their learning, or 
how does that look like for them? Sorry, and I think for me, the ability to have the opportunity to choose and being able to control what I know and expressing that to instructors, I think that's, that's what was important and my key takeaway is by giving the option to have a choice, it's more of a dynamic uh, relationship and um, also mitigates some of the power dynamic where I feel like I am in control of my learning. So that's what was really helpful in my key takeaway here. Your dog is really excited there, Parm too. All right, so we've got two minutes left. Uh, we just want to extend our gratitude for all of you for participating today and being here with us. And, um, you know, like we said, um, to have, you know, compassion and grace towards oneself when, you know, you're wanting to do this work, um, it, it can be challenging and, and that's sort of by design. So, you know, um, and, and knowing that every, you know, every, little change you know does add up not to sound too rose colored glasses and but you know it's finding community and, and making changes where you can and and really you know staying grounded in those values um and and believing in what you're doing um so uh and i wanted to especially give thanks to judy um who i initially approached a year ago about redesigning this summit of evaluation with this idea and uh, her support and for doing um this session with me today and especially in the cold and harm you know, you all are such busy, busy student occupational therapists, you're on placement. And so we're so grateful that you took the time out of your busy day to come and support um, others learning around this. So thank you, everybody, very much.